Uh, and now the next topic is uh, Swarm Kit. So last, uh, last June, we introduced orchestration uh, in Docker Engine. Uh, and as part of that, the plumbing component corresponding to it, corresponding to it is, uh, is called Swarm Kit. Uh, so you can find it on GitHub. And uh, we have uh, uh, three talks. Uh, so Steven is going to talk first. And he's going to talk about the, the data model in Swarm Kit. I really love his talk. I saw it at uh, LinuxCon. Uh, and he kind of paraphrases uh, Fred Brooks, uh, show me your algorithms and I shall be mystified. Show me your data structure and I will understand it. So after this talk, I think you'll understand the data structures in, in SwarmKit and the data model for it. Uh, and then Andrea is going to talk about the SwarmKit architecture and, uh, and Aaron as well. So Stephen. Oh. Uh, and before before Stephen starts, uh, one reminder: uh, you've all been invited into the Docker Community Slack channel. Uh, if you haven't been, you can go see Ashlyn at the entrance, uh, and that's one way where we can all collaborate uh, during these two days. Go for it, Stephen. Thanks, Patrick. So I got my uh, uh, club mate. So this should be a very very quick talk. <laughs> all right. So uh, so my name is Stephen Day. Uh, I'm going to be talking uh, uh, about SwarmKit and many of the uh, internals of it. Uh, we won't get into a lot of details, but mostly kind of high-level abstractions that, that are employed to solve the distributed systems problems. Um, so uh, I'm going to start out and talk about the object model. Um, first about me, I'm Stephen Day. I work for Docker. Um, that's my first experience mushroom hunting. Um, you can email me. I'm stephen at docker.com, uh, github.com slash stevu, and my Twitter is stevu. And Wherever my Steam ID is, Steve, you can see me play games. I don't do that too much. So uh, SwarmKit is a new framework by Docker for implementing orchestration systems. Um, the new orchestration features in Docker 112 that came out last June um, is is built on top of SwarmKit. Now, so orchestration systems ultimately, uh, when when you when you Take it, when you boil them down, they're simply a control system for your cluster. And um, so I don't, I don't know if everybody's familiar with like feedback control systems, but it's, it's a very simple concept. You have a cluster, and you need it to do things. Um, but uh, what you, what you want to do is, is actually say, hey, I want it to be this way, and then send a list of operations in, into it, and then read that state back out and actually uh, bring that back into an orchestrator. So we can, we can say, hey, uh, you know, it's just a very simple model for <laughs> how, we, how we can control these things. And, um, but when we start looking at all the problems in, in uh, an actual orchestration system, in an actual distributed system, um, this, this very simple diagram starts becoming very complex. Um, because as, as we start breaking things down, uh, this, this little line right here is much, much more complex than you would, uh, than, than you'd really think. In, in, in addition, this line right here, the delta, the, 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 the kind of input signal into the cluster, which I'll get, get into actually what that is, um, that's also complicated. So uh, we, we've designed a data model to actually to, to make this easier to do in the frame of this problem. So, um, whoops, uh, another, so another way of looking at it is we have uh, a function with a few inputs, like our desired state, the, the current state of the cluster, um, as well as the cluster. And so we have a state at, at time n, or time t, um, and we want to minimize the difference between s and d. Uh, so uh, this is kind of like a functional view. And what we, what we, what we actually call this is uh, convergence. So we, so we want to, we, we want to, we want to, so if we, if we want to say, uh, so like d would be our configuration, uh, and s is actually the, uh, the current state using uh, as observed by the cluster, and we want the difference between these to be uh, to be zero. And and what does that actually mean for the for for a user? It means that when you say I want my service running, indeed it is running. So so the the, the big aspects of this problem. So so we have these very simple slides, and the, and they're very cool to look at, and and sort of hand wavy mathy, um, but. So when you're talking about control systems, the, the, the main aspect of, of control systems are uh, the concepts of observability and controllability. And um, when you have a cluster of machines, uh, you end up with a continuum of data structures within that system 
um, that have various levels of, of, of uh, observability. So, uh, for instance, like failures, like observing an, uh, whether a node is failed or not, uh, is, has very low observability because you say, oh, I don't have a connection to that node, so it's gone. But do you know that really? Usually not. Um, other things like process state are e more easily observable because if you have an active connection and something's tell you, telling you that something's running, you know that, hey, it was running at least at that time before. So, uh, and, and then other things like user input, uh, we can actually put into high observability because we've integrated things like Raft in, in, in a data store, which Aaron will talk about later, to, to ensure that that observability can be achieved. So if we, take, if we take this control systems perspective and we break this down into our data model requirements, we, we have, uh, we, we can, what we're really trying to do is represent the difference in cluster state. We're trying to maximize the observability and support, while supporting convergence. And then, uh, you know, we need a bunch of features. So it has to be extensible and reliable and it needs to work. So, um, so basically, uh, to the tagline of this, of this portion of the talk, show me your data structures and I'll show you your orchestration system. So, um, so Stepping back a little bit, and, and I, I don't want to get too much into the specifics of SwarmKit. There's lots of information online, lots of documentation, but um, it, it's kind of important for, for, for some of the following slides to understand um, the, the, the concept of services. So services are just, it's just an application. It's like a set of containers. Uh, you say, I want to run n containers of this type, and there's some attract abstractions around that, such as like networking and, and volumes and uh, res resource requirements, placement. And, um, and that all in this service model actually represents your desired state. So if we go back to uh, this this slide here, this kind of input D is what we call the service, and in uh, in in the orchestrator component in that system is making sure that that service uh, is doing what is desired, and and having that active controller ensures that you, that you can. Um, get to your cluster state. So, you, so this, this is kind of a diagram just showing that like, hey, you have a green service and it's running across three nodes and you have a blue service running across a few nodes. Um, and that's, that's what you're trying to say with a service and you're, and you're trying to make that declaration. So, and, we, and, and so uh, looking at actual commands, we can say, uh, I'm, I'm gonna declare a network. Um, and then I'm gonna say, uh, I have a service that's going to connect to that network backend and then I can update that service by saying, hey, let's scale it to three instances. And then I can observe it by, by listing out the actual replicas that are running in this service. And so, um, so, you know, so once we've done all this, we can actually tell, hey, this is, this is converged and running. And if I had a cool demo, we could actually go hit Redis and, uh, and see that that works. Um, uh, I, I highly suggest that you check out the documentation and, and play with this. It's, it's quite cool. Um, so, so the so the way we do this um, in in the actual object model is is the um, we have we have a portion called a spec, which is actually the user input, and that was and uh, going back to the control systems analogy, um, that that's D, and then we have a current state, which is represented uh, and owned by the cluster, and so uh, the the kind of controls, uh, you know, going back to the controls analogy again. Uh, we have this loop here that uh, continually tries to take the desired state and, and write it back into this current state. Um, so this is actually a little bit more complicated in reality. And um, so uh, if we go back one more time to this control system slide right here, we have this little thing, this little delta thing. Um, and so it, if, if this were like a power controller, this would be a voltage signal. But inside of a, inside of a, a cluster system, we have this, the, this concept of tasks. And what, I can, um, and what we try to do is, is send these tasks without, uh, uh, within the cluster to try and um, get a certain set running. So, um, so, so I'll get into uh, the details of tasks in, in a few slides. But um, the idea is that you have a spec desired state and you have this current state, and you're basically sending out and trying to observe that these tasks are running. So if I say I want to run three container replicas, um, the, the, the orchestrator will try and ensure that there's actually three tasks in a running state. Um, and uh, I've, I've kind of shown, and what happens is these tasks will be sent out to the scheduler and they'll be dispatched to the various nodes, which, is, which, isn't, which isn't wildly important for this talk. So, uh, so what is a task? Um, a task is just, a, it's just an execution model, right? So you can say, prepare this task, which is, uh, I have set up resources, but more concretely, pulling an image is the classic like, preparation that you might do, do for a task. And then you start a task, and then you can wait on a task. 
and, uh, and then you can shut down a task. Uh, so the, in the interesting point here to, to point out is that uh, each, each of these uh, methods uh, correspond with, uh, with, with a task state. And so, for instance, if, if wait is, is blocking, if I call wait and it'll block, you're, in, you're considered in the running state. And so we, so we actually, uh, we, so we have, a, we have a, a state model, which I'll get into in a little bit, um, and, then, uh, and then a controller, which you can, you can uh, and all you do is implement these methods and then the state is reported for anything. So uh, the, the, one th the one thing I, I didn't mention here is, is so actually con we do control containers, but this task and runtime model could actually schedule anything. It, it's just an atomic scheduling unit of, of a swarm of, of machines. And so you can, you can just send these out. Uh, you, they, could be, they could be things like a, like a unikernel or a virtual machine, anything. It's a one-shot operation. Um, and uh, so uh, stepping back a little bit, uh, so, so what I want to show, so we have this kind of generic hand-wavy uh, al uh thing here. Um, and and the entire, so the entirety of this system is actually implemented uh, with uh, gRPC and protobufs. And so what we have here is the service spec, and this is the user input. And uh, within here, we have the tasks uh, spec uh, and, the, and an update config and an endpoint config. And then, uh, so, so uh, we also have the object component as well. So, the, uh, so what actually happens, if you, if you notice here, we have you know, the, the update config, and then in the actual object, which is the runtime object, we have the update status. So, uh, and we have the same thing for the, the network endpoint. Um, and so when you actually dispatch these tasks in the system, there's, there's a data flow aspect to it. We take user input as service spec, uh, task spec. We actually embed that into the service and uh, within the manager, which would be inside of like an orchestrator component. And then we, then we, then we take this part of the task spec and create tasks with this. So a service spec and a service actually works like a task factory in the cluster. So, um, so, so another aspect of our data model um, is actually uh, we, we, have, we have a consistency model for communicating task status back to uh, the cluster. Um, and, so, and, and part of this is a really strong field ownership. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, a, <laughs> a very, very strong field ownership model. And what we're actually doing is only one component of the system can write to, e to various fields at the same time. And um, this, is, this, this restriction uh, ensures that like, if a user writes a field and the orchestrator writes a field, we don't have to figure out which one was right. And um, there are a few cases where, where this, this model is too inflexible. And so, um, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, but, uh, but if we break down the actual, so, so this is the task spec, which is actually part of the service definition. Now, um, and, and so this slide is a little, probably a little hard to read, but um, hopefully we can see that, like, so the user owns, owns the task spec, and so we never, ever touch, so once you take in a task spec, we never, ever touch it um, inside, of, inside of the orchestrator. So you could, like, sign that, or you could, uh, or, or you can compare it with, with what you're actually doing. Um, so, and, and so the, the fields in green are actually owned by the orchestrator. So the orchestrator can allocate slot IDs and service IDs and can actually set desired uh, task state. Um, and then we also have an allocator uh, which owns the network portion of the, f of the, of the system. So uh, the, and the, the, mo the more interesting one to field ownership is, is, is the shared one, which is task status. And um, so what we actually do is as the task proceeds through the system, we, we do a handoff for the field ownership of task status. So, um, so th this is the state, uh, uh, this, this is the kind of the state diagram that I've drawn out for, for task status. And um, it, 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 we can go into detail uh, tomorrow if, you, if, if you're curious. But um, what happens is when you first create a task, it, it's on the manager and it progresses through these states. So you say the task is new and then it's allocated and it's assigned. So once it's assigned, we actually change the field ownership of, of the task status. So now, when you've assigned it, it, it's owned by the worker. And so you're basically handing off the system of record uh, to the worker. Um, now, what I, what I talked about um, a little bit uh, a few slides back was that this is a, these are actually one-shot operations in the cluster. And we always proceed from uh, in the same direction through the, through the task state. Uh, to a terminal state, and what this and, and these are actually 
uh, va values of a Lamport clock, so that new is always less than allocated. And what it means is when you re receive two task statuses, you know which value is the current value because it's actually less than the other. Um, so I had a slide for that. <laughs> so, so basically, um, we, so what we say that uh, when it's less than assigned, it, the, task state is, the task status is owned by the manager. When it's equal to or greater than assigned, the system of record is the worker. Um, so just kind of going back, so, so, so this process state that I've been talking about on our kind of observability continuum is, is, uh, is kind of mildly observable. Uh, I should, it's, it's in the middle because it's a remote operation, but like we can, we can observe it well and we have good data structures to actually do that. Um, so uh, just, just kind of reviewing back, uh, so I'm going to show you these slides really quick one more time. We, so we have our control system that, that, we, act, that, that, that we have our control system model that, that we can map our object model into. And, and so, so we can see that the parallels between this, uh, this feedback coming from the spec or the desired state, which is like a highly observable user uh, property, um, and, uh, and, and how this, these, ta this task mod, these tasks actually create the control for your cluster. So uh, and what I'm going to end this part of the talk with is SwarmKit doesn't quit. It's a, uh, it's a reconciliation system. Things don't error out. They're just never converged. And, and, this, and, and this data model is, is, is a great thing to build uh, these, these sort of cr cluster control systems on top of. So I'm going to, at this time point, I'm going to hand the uh, talk over to Andrea Lizarde, who will be talking about uh, the topology man management in SwarmKit. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, topology management. Uh, it's one of the core components of Swarm. So at the end of the day, a cluster is just a bunch of machines. So the first thing you want to do is uh, connect them to each other. Um, in SwarmKit, we have two main components. So we have managers that are responsible to manage the cluster state. And then we have workers that actually execute uh, the work, so your containers. Um, there are two main models like to uh, basically dispatch that workload. So there's push and pull. And this is not related to SwarmKit. It applies to any kind of distributed system. So there's not like clear winner. Like they both have uh, pros and cons. I'll try to like uh, summarize what they are and uh, which one, which model we decided to use and why and how did we uh, basically offset the drawbacks on, on going that way. So does it work? Yay. So on the um, push model, so you have a, a worker. The first thing you will do is register to like a discovery system, such as uh, Zookeeper in this case. Uh, on the other side, we have the manager just polling Zookeeper and to try and discover nodes. Um, Zookeeper will give it back like the list of uh, IPs and ports, and so that the manager then can uh, try and reach out to a worker directly. The second model uh, is the pool model. So the worker just connects to the manager, register itself. So he announces like, hey, I'm a worker, and I have this much memory and CPU, and I need work to do. And then the work just flows down that same, uh, that same path. So uh, the, like the main, I would say, uh, advantage of push is that you get to control the rate of communication. Since it's the manager like talking down, it can decide to dynamically you know, slow down um, the, the communication rate, or uh, it could, you know, basically buffer changes much much more easily. So it's actually probably easier to to uh, to scale. The uh, disadvantage, though, is that you have to set up like a zookeeper, and as Bill explained before, uh, it's kind of uh, tough, and um, you know, it's an extra moving part in the system. On the pool side, it's much simpler to operate. So your, uh, basically your clients, um, so in our case the workers, don't need to bind, they just connect. Uh, that means uh, it's easier to secure, like there's no extra port to, to secure. You can traverse networks, NATs, and so on. The inconvenience is that um, that connection has to be kept alive at all times. So uh, for SwarmKit, we, uh, we decided to go with the pool model. So we favor the uh, operational simplicity. Uh, and like we, we favor that over 
uh, the, the control rate. But at the same time, we engineered a few solutions to kind of, you know, uh, take back the, the rate control on our side. Um, so let's talk, uh, let's talk about rate control. Um, the so there's, there's a lot going on between uh, a worker and a manager, but it's mostly two things. It can either be heartbeats, so for presence, like the worker has to register and basically keep alive so that the, the manager knows that that worker is still alive. And the, the second part is, um, well, actually sending the payload. So for heartbeats, um, when the, the worker basically sends a ping and the manager responds with a pong, that pong actually contains the, uh, the next time the worker should uh, reach back. Uh, it sounds simple, but actually that's pretty powerful. Uh, it means that uh, you can configure the rate dynamically, so the operator can change it at any time. All the, the managers, so all of our servers agree on the same rate by a consensus to Raft. So whenever you know you had uh, I don't know, tens of thousands of machines and suddenly you want to slow down the, the ping rate, you can just uh, reach out to one manager uh, express your interest in increasing the uh, heartbeat rate, and it will just sync up with the other one, agree on the new uh, on the new rate, and and move on. The other interesting part, um, like if they were all to ping at the same time, it would be you know uh, too much. So instead of doing that, the manager adds jitter. So um, it, it the goal is to spread uh, the 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 connection load over time. So if you have ten ma uh, ten workers connected to a manager. Uh, and you know they say like uh, to the first one we'll say ping me back in five seconds to the second one ping me back in 5.1 second and so on so at least they're spread apart um, and so the, the the other part is uh, workloads um, so uh, we're helped a lot by gRPC so we um, the, the worker connects to the manager whoops the worker connects to the manager opens uh, a gRPC stream and at that point, you can just uh, receive workloads. Um, so the manager will actually buffer the workloads. So they're sent in batches. Like it would be too costly to just, uh, you know, send a new task every time they come in. Um, like I, I guess a good analogy for that is uh, train stations. So if every task uh, I have to travel from the manager to work independently, it's kind of like the, the task has to drive down to the worker. So every time the task comes in, takes a car, drives down to the manager, to the worker, uh, it's not very efficient, like there's a lot of overhead, and also like it might cause traffic congestion. So if you have many tasks traveling at the same time, they get stuck in traffic. What we do instead, uh, we have like a train station. So the manager just ships its tasks to the train station. They and and we have a train leaving every uh, 100 milliseconds. So they get in, they hop into the train, and then the worker is literally like uh, processing tasks by the train load. Um, there are a few twists. So uh, whenever the train gets full, so whenever like uh, we have a uh, hundred seats. Uh, that go from the manager to the worker. When it's full, it just leaves immediately. And if there is no one in, like if there are no tasks, uh, we just you know do nothing. So we don't send unnecessary data uh, from the manager to the worker. There are some like workers that are not really you know uh, exotic locations. They might not have like a bunch of resources or uh, overth not, or they don't match the constraints. So the the communication over uh, overhead will be very little. Um, we lose uh, like uh, we lose a little bit of speed. Like it means that since they take a train, like it only leaves every 100 milliseconds, but uh, that's nothing compared to how much we gain in efficiency. Um, so, so far we had like a single uh, worker and a single manager. It's pretty easy. But what happens when you have more? Uh, so since it's a distributed system summit, I'm guessing like we're going to talk about multiple uh, client and multiple servers. Um, in the SwarmKit architecture, a worker can simply connect to uh, any manager. So we have two kind of managers. Uh, we have follower and a single leader. So they are elected to Raft, and the um, leader manager is doing all the work. So uh, a worker can connect to any manager it pleases, and it will automatically forward the request to the main leader. So they don't need to know who's currently the leader and who's currently just a follower. 
when you have multiple workers connecting to a single manager, uh, it's going to multiplex all those requests into a single socket to the leader. Uh, that's again thanks to gRPC. So we use uh, gRPC channels, which in turn are backed by, uh, I think, uh, HTTP2 streams. Um, so let's say that you have, you know, 2,000 workers connected to a single manager. There's only going to be a single socket going from that manager to the leader, and it greatly helps reduce the networking load across the cluster. Um, which, like uh, that, for instance, we learned a lot from, um, from uh, Swarm, uh, and that was our main bottleneck, so that's why we designed it to, to work this way. On failure, because like, it's always going to fail, um, there's a new like, round of election going on. We select like, a new, uh, we promote a follower to leader, and the traffic, like all the other managers are aware of who's the new leader, and will forward the traffic automatically. Um, and it's completely transparent to the workers, so they don't need even need to know that the, the, the other manager failed. Um, there's another interesting part. So whenever a worker connects to a manager, uh, it gets a list of all the other managers available in the cluster. And uh, we keep that list up to date. So if you promote another worker to manager, uh, all the other workers are going to be aware that there's a new server available in the cluster. And that's kind of helpful um, because whenever a manager fails, uh, the worker will randomly reconnect to, to, a, different, uh, to a different manager automatically. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we try to, uh, you know, there's a machine failing. You have thousands of connections open from workers to that one. We don't want to uh, reconnect to the same machine, otherwise we'll bring it down. So we spread the connections over time. Uh, and that's, uh, again, uh, gRPC is helping a lot with exponential backoff and uh, reconnection jitter. Um, and we also have an another feature which we currently don't use much, but uh, it's still in the protocol. So we have manager weights. Uh, every server in a cluster has a, has a weight. So that's basically a preference. Uh, right now, they're weighted the same, but um, it allows us to put like a preference uh, into a machine, so we can prioritize one, or we can actually uh, gracefully shut down servers by, uh, you know, downgrading our, uh, like, um, reducing our preference, so the clients will automatically reconnect to different machines. And uh, on the last topic, we have presence. So presence on a distributed environment is uh, it's kind of hard. Like everyone has to agree on whoever is up and who's down. Uh, we are we are relying on Raft for some of that and on some tricks for for other stuff. So uh, our leader, uh, the, the like SwarmKit leader, is aware of the uh, basically the state of every uh, of every node if they're up and down, and will commit that to Raft. So it spreads across every single other manager, and they all agree they'll have a consensus on who's up and who's down. Um, in case like the leader goes down, a new one is elected, and it will just resume from there. So it, it already knows like uh, which machines were down at the time of election. For heartbeats, though, so um, whenever there's a ping pong, uh, you know, um, if workers stop pinging, we have to consider them to be down. We cannot store <coughs> the last um, TTL into Raft because it would be very expensive. Like. Um, a client sends a ping, and if we start into RAF, we would have to send a message to every single manager, wait for quorum, wait for the disks to, to flush, and so on. So instead of that, we're just keeping the, the TTLs into memory. Um, so it's we, we're using like a heap to, uh, to, to do that, like it's implemented in Go by a time after funk. Um, so it's very effective, and basically, whenever a manager fails, the new one will just assume that you know the, the nodes that were up are maybe not really up, so it will give it it will give them a grace period to reconnect. If they reconnect in time, we will you know keep them as up. But if they don't, then they will be flagged as down. So um, we learned like many many lessons from running uh, like Swarm for a year plus, and uh, both in term like of usability, but also in performance and scalability and definitely in uh, failure scenarios. With uh, the new topology management, we can you know, easily scale to thousands of machines and even on like very modest hardware. Uh, 
So thank you very much. I will uh, let Aaron now continue on the data store. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the distributed data store that we built for SwarmKit. Uh, my name is Aaron Lehman. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Docker, and uh, my email and GitHub information is up on the slide if you want to take a picture so you can get in touch with me, but I'll also be around uh, during this conference to talk to. So as Stephen mentioned in his part of the talk at the beginning, we have this object model where we have all these objects flying around, and uh, there's some different data that's involved. We have user input, like the desired state that someone has set up for services. We have observations about what nodes are up and things like that. And uh, we have a whole object model with clusters, nodes, services, and so on. And we need a place to put all these objects. Uh, it needs to be durable, redundant storage so that we don't have a single point of failure if a manager goes down. And typically what orchestrators do is usually to use an external key value store like Zookeeper or etcd. Um, it's actually a pretty straightforward approach. You set up one of those services and then point your managers to uh, contact those and use them as the source of truth. But uh, we took a different tack with SwarmKit. We decided to embed our own distributed data store. And there were a couple different reasons for this. Uh, one is a user-facing one. We want it to be really easy to set up SwarmKit. So by embedding this, we remove the dependency on a key value store. Um, and that means you can just run a command to set up SwarmKit and Swarm mode in Docker instead of uh, pointing to an external service. And there's some uh, technical advantages for us too. We can reduce the number of round trips that we need. Uh, instead of having to go out to an external store and fetch this information, it's already stored in memory uh, on, the on each manager. So they maintain these synchronized copies and they can do really fast lookups of whatever information they need. And part of that is that they can do local indexing. So sometimes for orchestration, we want to do certain lookups, like which tasks are running on a certain node. And instead of a complex query, that's just something we can really easily look up in memory because we can build indices over all those things. So the first part of this, I'm mostly going to talk about what we do in memory on the managers, because this is a replicated data store, but it's actually really interesting to see how the local copies work. Uh, as Steven mentioned, we use protocol buffers a lot, and our messages uh, are actually the objects that we use in memory. So those are generated by the protobuf compiler. And we store those in an in-memory database called GoMemDB, which was uh, open sourced by HashiCorp. And it's based on a data structure called a radix tree. And that gives us some really interesting advantages that we can build on top of. So just to quickly go over what a Redix tree is and how it works. This is an example with just some English words. So you could think of it as a prefix tree. Um, I have in green these words like hello, helpful, world, work, and so on. And some of them share common prefixes. So those get, uh, those share a common ancestor in the tree, like hello and helpful have H-E-L as a prefix. And one of these prefix nodes would be inserted wherever you have a, a common prefix that gets shared. So let's look at how we use this in SwarmKit with our actual data. Uh, instead of storing words, we're storing these objects like tasks and nodes. So uh, we can actually build multiple indices uh, on top of this tree. W what we do is we prefix our key with the type of index we're using. So the first one on this left side is just a set of tasks by ID. And here I have tasks A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and so on. And uh, the key is just ID and then the task ID. And since all the keys start with ID, they're grouped in this common place in the tree. I, I also want to keep track of which tasks are running on which node. And in this case, A, B, C, D is actually running on a node called 1, 2, 3, 4. And so is E, F, G, H. So I can put other keys in my tree with the node prefix and then the node ID and the task ID that's running on that node. So here I have the same tasks, but grouped underneath a node, and I can go look for 
what's running on node one, two, three, four, and I see I have these tasks. So one of the things that's really cool about this radix tree structure is it gives us some great properties for doing uh, fast snapshots in memory. So when I showed the example of the tree, I kind of glossed over what's actually happening in that tree, but in our implementation, these lines are actually pointers. So if we have a pointer to this root node, that means that we have uh, an entire view of the tree. As long as the nodes in the tree are immutable, uh, all we need is just a pointer to this root node, and then we have a consistent view of all the information. So to give an example of how that works in practice, let's say I want to add something new to this tree, um, a new task with ID QRST. And uh, when I do that, I actually don't want to go and modify this intermediate part of the tree because uh, if somebody has a snapshot, I don't want them to be influenced by my change. So what I'm going to do instead is kind of a copy on write operation where I'm going to replace this uh, ID, one, ID node with a new one and it's like a copy on write operation. So it references these four existing nodes and the new one and then as a last step, I update the root of the tree and I point to my updated ID node. So now uh, this is all like copy on write operations and if somebody was referencing the original tree, they would never see my changes. And that's the basis that we use to build transactions in the SwarmKit data store. So uh, we decided to make everything a transactional interface and uh, it actually ended up being quite elegant. For read transactions, it's basically just what I was going through on the previous slide. There's this concept that you uh, get a pointer to the root of the tree, and since nobody's modifying things that are pointed to by that, you have a consistent view. For a write transaction, it's pretty similar. You take a snapshot, just like for a read, and then you can make changes with the copy on write approach, and once you're done making all those changes, you commit them by replacing the root of the tree with your new root that's the result of your copy on write operation. And that's just an atomic pointer swap, so there's not even any locking involved. We decided to only allow one write at once in our data store. Uh, that was kind of a conscious decision to make sure that we didn't have transactions that were conflicting with each other. And uh, so far I've been talking about what happens in memory, but remember this is actually a replicated data store in a distributed system. So when you tell the transactional interface to commit something, it's actually going to wait until all the members of this raft cluster acknowledge that change and uh, you have a, a quorum that has consensus on it. So it's a pretty simple uh, code interface, but it's actually going out behind the scenes and replicating it. And I wanted to go through the code a little bit just to kind of give an example of how things work. So this is a read transaction. And the way I do that is I call a view function and I pass it a callback. That callback, it gets passed a transaction and that read transaction is just a consistent view of the data store at that time. Here it's just finding the tasks in the system that have a certain service ID using this by service ID selector. And then when it gets that back, it's, there's a loop that prints out the task IDs. Then this is an example of what an update looks like. And it's kind of a similar approach. It's still calling a function called update, and this one gets passed a callback that can actually make changes. So it's a, a different kind of transaction object. You can still use uh, functions like get task that are just reading, but you also have the ability to pass this into update task. So that's uh, something that's actually making a change to your local copy that exists inside this callback. And once you return from the callback, that's the queue for the data store to commit that change. Um, as long as you don't return an error from the callback, it will take all the changes you made inside it, write those out to the nodes in Raft, and uh, continue. So one other cool thing we have on top of this is the concept of watches. We wanted a way to see if there are any changes to objects or if new objects are added or objects are destroyed. So inside our code, it's possible to register a channel and receive uh, whatever changes we're looking for. So there's kind of a rich uh, 
way to specify what you're looking at. And I wanted to go through a, an example of that. Uh, it's actually a fairly complex example, but I think it's kind of worth illustrating the kinds of things we do in SwarmKit. Uh, this is the first part of an example that's taken from the actual orchestrator. And this is the part of the orchestrator that does rolling updates. When it shuts down uh, an old version of a task, it wants to wait for it to actually shut down before it starts up the new one to replace it. So that's what it's doing with this watch. And uh, this slide is only showing the first part of it. But it's calling a watch function and passing it an update task event. And the first part of it is kind of a template of the task that it fills in. So one part of that is the ID of the old task that it wants to monitor. And it also wants to wait until the state of that old task reached a state that's greater than running. So it filled in the ID of the old task and the uh, state it's looking for in this template. And then there's a checks field where it can tell the watch code that it wants to match that ID part of the template and also check for the, a state greater than the one I put in the template. And then this is the rest of that, because as I mentioned, it's a, a somewhat complicated example, but it lets you see that you can actually add many things to your list of selectors. So in this case for the orchestrator, if you have uh, a node go down while you're waiting for the task to update, you also want to treat that like the task stopped running, because uh, if, if the node went down, you're never going to hear updates about the task. So this event update node is waiting for the node to reach a status of down. And uh, it also fills the node ID into the template so that uh, the watch code only reports when that particular node goes down. And the checks field specifies that those are the important parts of the template. And then uh, the last part is if the node were to be deleted from the swarm, then it's exactly the same thing. We also want to treat that like the old task went down. So most of this so far has been about what happens locally in memory on uh, a manager when it's reading and writing from the data store. But of course, it's replicated. So how does that work? One of the important things is we decided that only the leader of the raft cluster should do writes. And there's actually multiple ways to do this. Uh, we, we also considered a model where any manager could write. And that's a workable approach. But the problem with that is you could have conflicting things that end up in your raft log. Like maybe you change uh, some property of a service, and then a, another manager changes that in a conflicting way. So you would need an algorithm to kind of resolve conflicts after things have been committed to raft. And we decided it's simplest to just only let things get committed to raft when we know they're not going to conflict. And having only the leader write is a simple way to do that. So when you're doing one of these write transactions, like the uh, example with calling update, what's actually happening is it's not just changing this radix tree in memory. It's also keeping a log of all the changes it made. And since we use protocol buffers for all our objects, keeping that log is, is actually really simple. We're just appending these protocol buffer objects to an array. And once we finish our transaction and decide to commit it, we just serialize that array. And we send it out to all the followers on the raft cluster. So all they have to do is just receive this serialized array of the changes. And they apply the same changes to their local radix tree. And that's how they stay in sync. So it's a pretty simple model. We have this in-memory data store on the manager. And whenever it makes changes, it logs them, sends out the list of changes to all the followers, and they just deserialize and replicate all those changes. Uh, one other thing we decided to add is, is the concept of a sequencer. We wanted to make sure that you didn't have writes that step on each other. Um, for example, if you have one user trying to change a service to five replicas and another trying to change it to six, uh, you don't want other changes that may have been made in the interim to be wiped out. So, uh, the way we do that is we have a version field in every object. And that version field gets checked when you update the object to make sure that there were no changes in between when you first received the object and made changes and then when you tried to update it. So it's kind of like a check and set. It's basically you're supplying the provenance of the object that you're updating. Uh, but instead of supplying the full old copy, 
it's kind of a shorthand where we just give the store a version number and it checks if that base version is the latest. And this is exposed in internal code. Uh, one of the places we'll use it internally is if we want to do some expensive operation, we can just do a view transaction, which is not going to block the store, and you know, do something expensive, list a bunch of objects, figure out what we need to do. But then once we've figured out how we're going to proceed, we can do an update that takes that lock on the store, and we can just go ahead and make all the updates we want and not really worry if something else has changed it in the meantime because the sequencer will reject anything that doesn't, uh, that isn't up to date. So we also expose this for the APIs, actually. So if you use the SwarmKit APIs or the Docker APIs to fetch a service or fetch a node and make an update to it, you get a version number back from the API. And you have to include that when you call the API to update it so that you can kind of prove that you have the latest version and you're not overriding someone else. And this is like a really simple example of what it looks like in code. You just retrieve the service and uh, you make, make a change to it, like change the image in there. And then when you update it, you also pass the version. So the sequencer knows that you have the up-to-date one. And then just shown visually, like here's an example where I have a service object. And it has a couple properties, like four replicas and a certain image that it's running. Right now it's version 189, because that was the raft index when it was last updated. And if I want to make a change to this, like I want to update my image to a newer version of the registry, then when I submit the update request, I also give the version of 189. And because I've included that, the sequencer knows that this is valid and I haven't missed anything in the meantime. But uh, this gives me a new base copy of the object. And if someone else comes in and they have a request based on an old version, here they're trying to change the number of replicas but they have the old image version in here because as you can see from the version fields, they were based on the old version. So the sequencer rejects that. You have to have the latest base version to be able to make any updates. Uh, we also have the concept of write batching. And the reason for this is that every time we make a write to Raft, we have to go and get consensus from all the other nodes in our cluster. And that's kind of expensive. It involves network latency, for example, and writing to disk. So if we're doing a bunch of things, like iterating over the services on our system and making some change to them, we don't want to do individual raft writes for each one of those. It just takes too long. But we also don't want to throw that all into one transaction, one write, because we want to put a practical limit on the size of a write to the raft cluster. Otherwise, it could just take a really long time, and that could cause issues with heartbeats and things like that. So that's what we have the batch perimeter for, and it's a way to abstract this notion of letting the store figure out what makes sense as a unit of size to send out updates. So when you use the batch method, the store will decide for you how many transactions to split this group of updates into. And this is an example of how that looks in our code. This might be a little bit tricky to go through, but I'm just going to try to explain what's going on. It's kind of like doing an update, but instead of calling update, you call batch, and you get back a callback that takes a batch object. That's, that's what you pass into the batch. So and typically in a batch, you'll loop over a bunch of objects. And for each one, you'll call an update method on the batch. And inside this callback you pass to it, you can do any changes you want atomically. So generally, you would just do one or two small things, and those are all guaranteed to land in the same transaction. But this group of updates could be merged into a larger transaction or might end up in separate transactions depending on what the store thinks an optimal size is. And this is an example from our dispatcher. Earlier, uh, Andrea was talking about how when leaders take over from an old one, they don't have the latest heartbeat timestamps. So they put these nodes in an unknown state and they're waiting for uh, heartbeats to come in so they can figure out, are these nodes dead or alive? And this is a slightly paraphrased version of the code that does that. It's just looping over the nodes that it knows, uh, retrieving the latest version of each one from the store, and then setting their status to unknown. So there's a couple things we're thinking about adding on top of this in the future. 
Uh, one feature that we're missing right now that we could really benefit from is multi-valued indices. The way our indexes work is that you have to have one value for any given object. Like a good example is an index of which tasks are on which nodes. A task is going to have at most one node that it's assigned to, so that works in the current model. But we've hit some cases like figuring out which networks are attached to a service. And there could be multiple networks. So we don't really have a good way of uh, indexing that with GoMemDB. And we'd also like to expose this watch API to uh, external users and tools. So it's a really rich thing we have right now uh, for our internal code, where you can just get this Go channel that gives you exactly the changes that you're interested in. But I think it would also be really cool to expose that as a Docker API. So you can you know, watch for a service to converge, for example. And a last thing that we've kind of been thinking about but haven't really made decisions about yet is building version control into this distributed data store. Uh, there's been a couple scenarios where we like to present historical information to the user, like what was a service before the current configuration. So it may actually make sense to have this as a first class feature where for every object we store, we actually track all the changes that we made to it. And we could use that for both internal uses and exposing to the user history about all the things in the cluster. So that's the end of uh, my portion of the talk and also our time slot. So uh, thanks very much for listening. And uh, I think we have about five or 10 minutes. Yeah, five minutes uh, to take some questions. All right, th this is my first one, so I didn't know how civilized everybody was. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I, I really like this uh, uh, timeout response thing you have with, the, or with the, um, the Pong mechanism where you tell them how frequently to check back. And I was just wondering, um, how, does, how do you handle situations where messages are lost? Do you also have to do something clever there? Do you wait and retry things based on some factor of the Pong time? Does it happen enough that it actually matters? I, I guess we gave the microphone out to the audience. Uh, yeah, there's a train. There you go. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, the, uh, so the so the, the manager is expecting the worker to ping like after uh, X amount of time, but we give it like there's a huge buffer. We actually multiply that by three, so we get to miss uh, two of those messages before kicking out the, the the node from rotation. So yeah, they might be missed. I mean, in distributed systems, it's all about you know missed messages and ordering and duplicate messages. So the system is built to deal with that and will just uh, buffer out the, 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 the heartbeat rate. Uh, we, we also, um, all those messages are actually going over TCP. So we found that to be pretty reliable in practice. And there's not a lot, lot of missed messages. If we change the channel with which we were communicating in, in this, th this would be a bigger problem, but we, we have thought about it in that context, so I think we can handle that problem if it, if it does arise. Thank you, Stephen. Yep. Oh. Is there any scope for using um, the Swarm API to monitor, monitor nodes more formally, so not just to enforce the state and use a feedback loop, but to do the kind of thing that we'd use C-Advisor, node exporter, and all of that stack for. Is there some way we can link into that and take advantage of what you've built? Uh, sure. Yeah, so, so we are looking in, into that right now, and um, you know, in the theme of observability, it's all about getting the data there. So, so we're, we're doing some things to uh, get data in place and actually be able to observe 
more interesting aspects of the system. And so one of this would be uh, correlating like application metrics with the actual metrics emitted from the Docker engine all the way up into the Swarm Kit managers. So uh, this is something we're looking at. The, the problem is getting the data in place and actually making that available uh, to make decisions on that data. So, so making those decisions probably isn't that complex. It's just having that data to be able to uh, in the right place. Does that answer your question? I mean, um, so you're talking about making decisions, but what about just monitoring, just for metrics? Like you might do with something like Node Exporter. What's the pressure? How much memory is available, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, so so I, I went a step further then. Yeah, so we do need to get uh, more monitoring in place to, to make that, but also there's we, we do want to be able to use that data uh, as, as feedback. So, uh, so hopefully we get both of those features out of that. Is that, okay. is that clear? So the, he asked, uh, what's the largest uh, swarm deployment uh, that we've uh, had, and how long did it last? So there, there are, I guess, multiple responses. Uh, I think the biggest one we ever had was right before DockerCon. We, we spun up like 10,000-ish machines for, I don't know, overnight, just to see if it sustained like uh, uh, the load for, for the entire night before DockerCon. Uh, there has been there there have been like a few community tests like uh, Chanwit uh, is a community member and uh, basically crowdsourced uh, a, a scale test so it basically borrowed machines from uh, a bunch of people and spun up I think 2,200 machines something like that 2,000 okay uh, and right now it's I think it's trying with 3,000. Uh, so so far, like we tried to reach the limits, and so far our limits have been like the uh, AWS like accounts limit. They like you have to. I think they start at 100 machines that you have to you know uh, file a request to get to 1,000, and then by 10,000 you actually have to call, and we we, we kind of have to figure out like uh, you know how to test on I don't know 20,000. Um, it's surprisingly like. It's surprising how much like a, you know a server can actually handle in terms of connection. We think you know uh, we need you know a ton of servers to be able to handle that many machines, but it's very easy for like on uh, modern hardware to handle you know under thousand connections easily. So uh, and I think like we don't currently see a, a bottleneck, uh, but we're planning to. We're planning to put in place a recurring uh, scale test. So like maybe uh, once a month, something will basically spin up, launch like 50,000 machines, run on uh, a ton of commands, and then see how, how it goes. Oh, uh, I think, yeah. Um, I had a question about the data store and specifically the watch API. So the examples you were showing looked like they were uh, monitoring individual nodes or basically you know, individual nodes in the radix tree. Um, is it possible or is that actually going to fire if any children um, are updated or is it really just monitoring? You know, uh, the way it works is it basically has these filters to decide what uh, should trigger the events to be sent. So it's pretty flexible. In the examples, I was saying I want uh, objects that have certain IDs and things like that. But uh, actually, one model that we use somewhat frequently in SwarmKit is we'll just put no filters on it. And then you get a, an entire stream of whatever kind of change you're looking for. So you could just say, give me all service updates, for example. And then you could have some uh, code on top of that that's just filtering for which ones you're actually interested in. A related question, have you thought about pot potentially using that to model like a hierarchical sort of, uh, you know, nested key space, you know, not unlike, uh, you know, TD or Zookeeper using the, the similar watch semantic? Uh, I don't think we have specifically, like, the, the keys that I showed in the presentation are actually sort of like a low-level detail of how this is put in our database. But as, as, much, as far as we use the API, uh, we're not really aware of those keys. It's, it's more like a high-level thing where we address objects by either their IDs or their names or whatever's convenient uh, from the code. So it, it's not really a, a hierarchical key space as far as API users are concerned right now. 
uh, to expand on that. Um, so the problem with hi hier hierarchical data models, if, if I could even say that word, um, is that typically we want to um, be able to index our data by uh, a large number of, of indexes, right? And so once you put uh, your data model into a hierarchy, it tends to uh, make the queries that you can do against that data, data model less flexible. Um, to get the same thing, the, the same use case that you're talking about, it would be it would be interesting to be able to group data into like boxes or cubes, and then be able to query events and changes from those cubes based on their relationships. But I mean, we're, we're not building a database; we're trying to. So, but at some point, yeah, it, th that that is something that that we we'd have to think about. But I, I'm not sure about the application in in SwarmKit yet. 